AR, she, you know, the AH is after all of the words. Okay, to let us continue on with our lovely topic of tiny little organisms called prokaryotes. We are on about in and around 299, yep, that's where, we where we looked at the head of a pin and all of its disgustingness last class. Well, and it's amazing that we as organisms have developed protection mechanisms to um, where do I want to go with this? Yeah, protect us from some foreign invaders. So prokaryotes are everywhere. Their cell numbers number way more than the eukaryotes on this planet. They're very, very small, much more simple. And we can find them in all different places in our environment. Um, again, some of them can be caustic to other organisms, but some of them are also very beneficial to organisms, specifically humans. So we find them in lakes and rivers, oceans, decomposers, getting rid of dead matter. Why is, de uh, why is a decomposer so important in our ecosystem? Yeah, it breaks things down so we can recycle those molecules that were created. So decomposers in our environment are extremely important so we can utilize the substances from dead decaying uh, organisms. Organic waste materials returning vital chemical elements to the environment. Plants being able to utilize some of these molecules that they normally wouldn't be able to in their larger form. Prokaryotic cells, a little bit about them. They lack a membrane enclosed nucleus. They lack other membrane enclosed. So here's the key, membrane bound. When you think of organelles, parts of cells that have membranes around them, that's a much more organized cell. So that would be what kind of cell? a eukaryotic cell. So prokaryotes, the opposite. Lack those membrane-bound and closed organelles. Some of them also have some extra protection because they have what we call cell walls. Now cell walls, we learned a little bit about them when we talked about photosynthesis. Who has cell walls? Plants. Plants. But some prokaryotic organisms, simple organisms, also possess a cell wall. It's not quite the same function as the cell wall in the plant, which was sort of the plant's skeleton that gave it structure. But it does provide protection for the cell, helps so that they don't dry out and so forth. Displays an enormous range of diversity with respect to what they look like and what they can do and where they're found. Some of them have the ability to move through aquatic environments with extracellular parts like flagellum. So this is an example of a simple organism, prokaryotic organism, that can move through its environment with flagella. So did I skip? Why is that in there? Whoops, something happened. Okay, I don't know what that's doing there. Are those prokaryotic cells, by the way? Maybe I put that there because, let's pretend, I wanted to show you that prokaryotic cells look nothing like this. Yes? Like, where the heck did that so when we talk about eukaryotic cells, we have a much more highly organized cell. Um, again, cell walls can be seen in plant cells. Well, where? 
well, we don't we think we theorize that that might have been the incorporation actually of uh, an organism into a cellular structure. So, all right. So back to the prokaryotes. Three most common shapes for prokaryotes are little spherical balls called cocci, or they might be pill-shaped rods called bacilli, or they might be curved and spiral. Sometimes we refer to those guys as spirochetes. On page 300 in your textbook, we see some of these guys up close and personal. This is a very large magnification. Your microscopes in the lab, have you guys looked at any bacteria yep. in lab? Yes. Very, very small, yes? What magnification did you have to use? Oil immersion. Yeah, you had to go with oil immersion, and even then, they were pretty dinky, yes? So that's what magnification on your compound light microscope. What magnification? A thousand times magnification. This is what? No, what's no, TE? Yeah, transmission electron microscope. So, yeah, we don't. Wish we had a lot of money to buy one here, but we don't. So this is much, much larger than you guys can actually see with your compound light microscopes. Again, the cell size is going to be much smaller than that of a eukaryotic cell. All prokaryotes are unicellular. Some species will hang out in groups. And we see, we'll see uh, uh, some examples in a minute. So they exist in two or more groups, but they're separate entities in themselves. Exhibit a very simple division of labor among specialized cell types, or are very large, dwarfing some eukaryotic cells, believe it or not. And there's an example in your book of something called a giant bacterium on page 300. So some of them can be pretty large, hang out in groups. Actinomyces hang out in groups. Cyanobacteria, these are the single cells that hang out in groups. So some of these guys might have been the beginnings of what we see as multicellular organisms. These might have been the beginning of that. That little thing that's glowing over there in the corner, that's the little giant bacteria. Like a blue-green algae right. type of guy? Didn't know where to put it, whether it be a bacteria or algae, because it's photosynthetic. It's, there are photosynthetic bacteria as well. They found it. It's not missing. So after about half of all prokaryotes are mobile, because, again, they're single cells, and they have to get around in their environment in order to get what? The food that they need. Many of these travel using that little extracellular piece called the flagella. In many environments, prokaryotes can attach in groups of highly organized colonies. And they call these groups of a whole bunch of bacteria that tend to hang out together biofilms. Many consist of one or several different species of prokaryotes. Biofilm yep. Yep. Many include some protists and some fungi in this group. So it's kind of like a neighborhood almost when we talk about a biofilm. It's not necessarily one single organism that forms it. Can show a division of labor. One of the organisms in a biofilm might degrade something that another organism in the bio biofilm needs. So they work together. In here, it's nice because all the different organisms are stained. So we see this light blue organism, and we see this little purple organism. 
and we see this green organism. And this is an example of what we might find in a biofilm. They can form on almost any type of surface, rocks, metal, plastic. Yeah, and what is it? Dental plaque. Plaque. You know that crud on your teeth? That's plaque. And what do you think that likes to eat? Whatever you're eating, especially sugar. Because remember, these guys, no, these guys, huh? Yeah, but they like to eat what more? No, they don't want to eat your teeth. <laughs> they hang out, they attach to your teeth. Okay, and they wear down. Your teeth are not are not inside is calcium, but what's the outside? Enamel. Enamel. The problem is when these guys get down into the gum line and they mess with the attachment of your teeth in its joint. Your joint, and I'm gonna give you a little anatomy lesson, the joint where your teeth are attached. That's called a gomphosis. And it's connective tissue that holds the tooth, which is bone and enamel, into the bone in your jawline. Those guys wear down that connective tissue. And that's what causes problems with tooth decay. Do I have my Yeah, OK, good. I'm waving my hands around. I wasn't sure if I whacked my microphone or not. So that group of organisms is going to wear down your connective tissue that holds your teeth in, loves it when you don't brush your teeth and there's some glucose all over it because they multiply at a rapid, rapid rate, yes? So why is it important to brush, not only brush your teeth, but what? Floss your teeth. I hate flossing. I'll tell you one of my dirty secrets. Yeah, you know what I where I floss my teeth? Shower. On the way to work in the car. Oh, you got a forty minute ride. I gotta do something. <laughs> but those little floss it's really important that you floss your teeth because when these guys get down into that gum line, they break down that connective tissue. So that's an example of a very common biofilm that we all know and don't love very much. Most of them reproduce by binary fission. And binary fission is basically very similar to what we talked about when we talked about mitosis. It's going to be an exact copy of me to make more of me. Because remember, these are single-celled organisms. They can divide at a very high rate if conditions are favorable. Back to the biofilm. If you leave all that nice sugar all over your teeth and you go to sleep and you kind of salivate all over those guys, because that's what you do while you're sleeping. Some of us have their mouth hang open and drool on their pillow, right? Perfect ideal conditions for that biofilm to multiply at a very high rate. Um, some prokaryotes have this sort of protection mechanism that they create. It's called a spore. Prokaryotes form something called an endospore because it's typically at one end or the other of the original organism. What it does is acts as a protective cell, kind of the, oh my gosh, things are getting bad. I will send you out to make more of me, depending on the conditions. So they produce when prokaryotes are exposed to unfavorable conditions. And these endospores are very hardy. They can withstand very adverse conditions, dried out conditions, hot conditions. So this is what ensures the organisms continuing. It's sort of that protection capsule when the organism is experiencing unfavorable conditions. So that's why they're really hard to get rid of. That's why they're really hard to kill. When we talk about different organisms and spore formation, well, that was my biggest nightmare as a research biologist. Because when I worked with organisms, very small um, cellular tissue culture organisms, those spores were the bane of my existence. 
because if any little spores in the environment got into my tissue cultures, what would happen? Happiness, yeah, they would start to grow because now, for whatever reason that they were deposited in the environment, now they're in favorable conditions and what are they gonna to start to do? Multiply like crazy. So fungus, molds, those guys also form spore-like structures. And then some of these prokaryotic guys do that too. So it's a protection mechanism for them. And it's a pain in the neck for somebody who's trying to do microbiology or tissue culture procedures in a lab. That's why um, sterile technique is very important. And when you did your uh, bacterial cultures in lab, if I, for some reason, touched that plate by mistake, and some of you probably actually did that, did anybody touch their plate to see what grew? That's always a fun one to do, too. There's tons of bacteria on your hands, right? So just you taking your unwashed hand and putting a thumb on it, you come back 48 hours later under favorable conditions, yummy, delicious food on the plate, and if I put it in the incubator, nice, warm, and toasty, that whole plate would be filled with bacteria. So they grow at a very fast rate, and they have those protection mechanisms, those endospores to help them out. No, it no. Was, it was like two years ago or last year or something like that. It got closed down because like everybody was getting like sick like, from whatever the toxins. Not were. like sick, but it was like meningitis, is it? Oh wow. And like a bunch of people died from it. You remember that? No. Anybody remember that? But that's a, that's a common occurrence, especially um, in labs that produce different medications or different uh, vaccines, for example. It's so important to keep everything in sterile. Sometimes you have negative pressure rooms, so nothing in the air will come down on your work because those endospores are everywhere in our environment. They like took like a sample of like the spinal fluid out of one of the people that got sick, and, like incubated it for like 48 hours, and this huge like film of mold grew on like, it was so gross. Yeah, and that's, yeah, that happens. So, and those organisms, when they get into your environment, can get into, you know, if you're trying to make a vaccine or you're trying to do tissue culture. Tissue culture is basically trying to grow cells that tend to hang out in layers together. You can actually grow them in the laboratory in plates. So different cells can grow like that in groups. So I used to, um, way back when in my previous life, used to grow cells in tissue culture and then work with them to try and develop different drugs to help kill them. So we would grow things like uh, breast cancer cells in tissue culture and then try to find drugs to help wipe them out. Once we found um, drugs that potentially would help to wipe out these cells, these cancer cells, then we would take that experiment further. So we would now take that chemical and see if we could kill off a tumor in an animal. And that's kind of, you know, the progression of how things go with respect to trying to, to, to develop, say, a chemotherapy drug. So you would, you would figure out a component, and what we worked on in my lab was um, derivatives of um, an extract taken from sea urchins. So the chemist in our lab, it's called a dolostatin. He would take that particular drug they knew that worked and then alter it to try and figure out if it, we could make something better to kill off uh, these cells. So one of my jobs was to test all of these different compounds to see how well and effectively they killed off these cells. Once we found something that killed off only a certain percentage, we then took it to the next step. So that's, that was part of what I did was, uh, way back when. 75 people died. Like, yeah, you, you send me that. Can you send me the link? Uh, I can, yeah. Thank you. I just found it on Wikipedia right now. Yeah. 
interesting. Yeah, and that happens, unfortunately, happens a lot. You know, when you have, especially, we all complain about the cost of pharmaceuticals, but if you knew how much money it took to develop one drug that actually makes it that far, it's, it's mind-boggling. Yep. And it probably costs crazy amounts of money to develop. Yeah, but now, do the math. How many drugs did they go through all of that research that didn't make them squat? I went. <laughs> you do the math. Go do some research. You'd be scared at those numbers. Well, I'll tell you, the oil companies are making a lot more. Oh, yeah. And you buy it, so we can't complain about that, right? All right, so some of the different terminology with respect to how these guys work. Photoautotrophs or phototrophs are going to do what? Right, so they probably have what inclusion in their cells? Chloroplasts. Some sort of chloroplast-like structure that can help them make or use energy from sunlight to undergo the process of photosynthesis. Chemotrophs, what are those guys doing? So they need to absorb chemicals from the environment in order for them to undergo. Correct. So autotrophs obtain carbon from who? in the form of CO2. CO2. So who might be an autotroph? Plants. Yeah, plants. Plant-like material with what? Something that they can carry on photosynthesis with. So moss, ferns, some algae. Some algae can't do that. Heterotrophs. They obtain carbon from at least one organic nutrient Glucose, for example, is one of the easiest things with respect to organic compounds to break apart and use to make energy. So we can group all organisms according to the four major modes of nutrition if we combine the energy source, photo, and chemo, so phototroph versus chemo, troph and the carbon source, autotroph versus heterotroph. So we can have a photoautotroph and we can have a photoheterotroph. Yes? Does everybody understand what I just said? Kind yeah. Of yeah. yeah, think about it. So autotrophs, where are they going to get their carbon from? Oh, right, care. so think about where they're getting their carbon. Auto. And think photosynthesis, okay? Hetero carbon from. I got to bring it in. Yes. Yep. In, in some way, shape, or form. Correct. So, dominant among multicellular organisms. So when we start talking about not the single cell guys. But the multicellular guys, a photoautotroph, we see a lot of them. So they carry on what? Yeah, using light energy and autotrophs, they get carbon from what? Carbon dioxide, exactly. And then chemo heterotrophs. And what do we have to do? Take it in. Yeah, take it in. So we get our carbon from glucose-like molecules. The other two modes are used only by certain prokaryotes. So in this case, light energy 
in, and you guys probably did an experiment about um, carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide. Did you do your photosynthesis experiment? Yeah. So you know what you used? Some plants in a test tube? Exactly. And what were you measuring? The amount of oxygen release. Yep. The release of gases, right? Okay. So that's your who? The uh, photo. Autotrophs. Yeah. Photo autotrophs, light without light. And you were kind of doing a little bit more with the light and dark reaction and looking at gas release. <clears throat> Some chemo autotrophs, bacteria from hot springs, for example use CO2 as well. Organic compounds. And this little guy, rhodopseudomonas, rhodopseudomonas, is a what? Yeah, he uses light, but uses what? Yeah, exactly. So he, get, he needs organic compounds in order to make his energy. And then, of course, well, he's using the light as part of the energy source, but he needs what in order to make whatever the molecule is? He needs to take in organic compounds as well. So that's why he's a photo light, but he needs to take his carbon in in the form of glucose. It's going to auto make it itself himself from who? Carbon dioxide. Do you see? Do you guys see? Good. All right, and this chemoheterotroph, he can't use light. He's going to do what? Exactly. So he's going to take, heterotroph means what? He's going to take it in, consume it from the environment, and he's going to, through chemical reactions, do all of his work. Okay? So these guys get their carbon from some sort of carbon dioxide-like reaction, these guys get their carbon from taking in organic molecules like glucose. All right, so two main branches of prokaryotic evolution. And this is, again, this is something new. Way back when, when I took my first biology class, these things didn't, weren't separated. What we're seeing is that they have very different metabolism, and they have two very distinct groups. So that's when the domain came about. So by comparing very diverse groups of prokaryotes at the molecular level, we've identified the fact that there are really two main branches of these guys, not just one. And we have bacteria, and we have archaea, and archaea are very closely related to eukaryotes with respect to the fact that they are a little bit more complex in their metabolism, even though structurally they're closer to who? The bacteria. So their, their complexity of metabolism is actually closer to the eukaryotic cell, but their physical appearance and structure is closer to the bacteria. So could this be what? Could this group be the, or the link between that simple bacteria and the more complex eukaryotic cell? Does that make sense? Yes. Do you have a question, though? Because of the fact that they have to deal with such adverse environments, they are much more chemically sophisticated with respect to metabolism than the bacteria around. So thus, life is organized into three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Bacteria and archaea, very close structurally, Archaea and eukarya, complex chemical. So that guy in between, 
kind of hangs with both of his friends. Make sense? Okay. So when we talk about some of the extreme adverse environments that Arcadia live in, we see um, them broken down ooh, into different groups. All of these environments are very extreme. So all of these guys are sometimes referred to as extremophiles. Halophiles, extremely salty environments. Now what's the deal with salt? What's the big deal with salt? Why is that, why is that adverse? Yeah, remember our discussion about tonicity and fluid inside cells? If I put um, a cell into an environment that's very, very, I'm trying to think, can you guys see this? Yeah. Okay. If you put, yeah, that's not good. If we have a marker that writes. So when we did our experiments with tonicity in the lab, and we had a cell with 10 percent, no, not 10 percent. My brain's gone. Sodium chloride. Your cells have 0.9% sodium chloride in the solutions that float around in them. You know what that's called? Have you ever heard that term? Yes. When you go to the hospital and somebody gives you an IV, there's going to be two things one of two things in that bag besides what they want to administer if they're giving you a drug or whatever. It's either going to be normal saline, which is 0.9% sodium chloride, or it's going to be, anybody else know? Why? Why do you think? That's what's inside your cells. Okay? It's point, I think it's, is it point five? My brain just went dead. Oh, I don't know. I'm just asking. Google that up. What should I Google? Um, of normal, normal glucose concentration inside cells. It's 5% or 0.5%. I can't so remember. Right, so if I put a solution in there, that really extreme salty environment, what's going to happen to this cell? It'll lose all its water. The water is going to rush out to do what? Try to equalize the, Try to equalize the concentration on either side of that semi-permeable membrane. That's an issue because what would happen to the cell in that extreme environment? It would shrivel up. It wouldn't be able to survive. But extremophiles, halophiles, have the ability to counteract the action of water. They have these little built-in pumps that can make sure that there enough water stays in within the cell. How about a thermophile? Really, really hot. Now, really, really hot's an issue when we talk about molecules like proteins. Are cells made of proteins? Yeah. And when we start to get too hot, proteins that normally have a very specific fold will start to do what? Unfold. Unfold. That denature, exactly. That's not going to allow them to work very well. What do we have? Um, it just says, it doesn't say percentage, it just says uh, concentration of glucose approaching 10 nm are, are pre diabetic levels. Oh, no. They're talking about um, blood glucose levels. I don't know, i got to Google that up. I want to say it's 5%. My brain is too full of useless information, unfortunately. <laughs> I can't get to that file. There's a 5 in there somewhere. Okay, and then methane. What's methane? Gas. Yeah, it's a carbon-based gas. It can be quite nasty. Um, and high levels of methane at the bottom of lakes and swamps, given off by decaying material, off gases, 
um, waste products, for example, farmers. You know, when you pass by that big cow pasture, woo, and you get that lovely whiff of, what is that? <laughs> no, go ahead. And what? No, I grew up with cows. And I love cows. I do too. And uh, the only reason that cow manure really reeks is if it's mixed with chicken manure. Chicken manure is nasty. It's nasty because I worked at the Costa Day Farms too. Oh. So, yeah, ew, ew, ew. So if you get cow manure that's just straight cow manure, it's actually a sweet smell. And not only that, but if you feed the cows what? That they're and, meant to eat. And, and, and that's what we did. Um, so it's not that bad. So it's not that bad. No, it's, it's actually got a sweeter smell to it. It's yep. The nasty smell of stuff is when it's mixed with chicken. Chicken. The, the, worst, the worst summer in my neighborhood was when my wonderful Italian father decided in his small little garden, because we lived in the city, yeah, to get chicken manure. Ew. Boy, did the neighbors hate him. Ew, ew, ew. That was horrible. Yeah, it's gross. So yeah, those are some of the gases, off gases of waste products. Um, these bacteria actually aid digestion in cattle and deer. Because that's in their bellies. Correct. Yeah, and, they, and when they eat those natural grasses, they're going to help with the digestive Absolutely. process. That's, those are the things, those are the ones that can break down all the grasses. And exactly. Stuff. Yeah. And then, of course, the way the, the digestive system of cattle is much different than humans. We ha They actually have four different okay. compartments. Exactly. I've seen, uh, because of, I've seen a cow's <laughs> Yuck! So these are some examples of um, different bacteria and bacterial growths in different regions. Um, yeah, or films that'll grow on the top of different areas. Um, aerial photo of salt processing ponds at the edge of San Francisco Bay. Colors of the ponds result from dense growth of harmful prokaryotes that thrive when the salinity of water reaches five to eight times that of seawater. Harmful? Yeah. Harmless. 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 Did I say harmful? Yeah. I'm sorry. Harmless. So, well, how do you make salt? <laughs> how do they make salt? Do you know how they make salt? Do they just evaporate all the Yeah, water? exactly. And then harvest the salt that builds up, the crystals or, after. Or the yeah, and that's you know that's how they that's how they farm salt, and then we see another heat loving uh, Yellowstone Park is where these guys are. And that's right around the geyser, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about those chimney, chimneys that are in the ocean? Yeah, those are sulfur producing, and there's organisms, extremophiles that live there too, because they they utilize the sulfur in the water or surrounding. So there's all kinds of them. And again, these are, these are kind of new to us because we thought, for sure, there was never, no way an organism could survive some of these extremes. But we're finding that they can. As a matter of fact, there's one um, that can possibly live in your gut, which, uh, live in your gut, live in your stomach, uh, which is an extremely acidic environment. Yeah, but as far as us discovering them, it's fairly new. It's called discovery. Maybe they just assume that uh, they came after. Right. So bacteria and other organisms that cause diseases are called pathogenic. So disease to other organisms. Most pathogenic bacteria and again, some pathogens live in harmony with their host. But most pathogenic bacteria produce off poisons that can actually be quite toxic to their host. 
some of these proteins are called endotoxins and bacterial cells secrete them into the environment. Um, endotoxins are not cell secretions, but instead chemical compounds that tend to be found in the outer membranes of certain bacteria. So, who's this guy? inside the nose. So he's not the flu, he's a bacteria. He's got kind of the same same guy, same kind of ending there, influenza, flu. Flu, that's a virus. But this bacteria gives some nasty endotoxins off. This guy can cause pneumonia. So we see him in the inner lining of lungs. About 4 million people worldwide per year are infected by this nasty little dude. I don't know. Good question. That might be some cellular material on the inside of the um, lining of the... There's like little sacs called alveoli inside your lungs. And what we're going to find in there is not only the cells that make up that lining, but there's also cells in there, your own cells, that help keep protected that region. So that, that might be correct. So the best defenses against these nasty little bacteria, bacterial diseases are keep, keep them out. So sanitation. We've also developed substances and the first antibiotics were developed from molds, believe it or not, and we found them by mistake. Yeah. Antibiotics. And basically what antibiotics do is prevent the cell for one reason or another, there's different mechanisms of action, present, prevent them from replicating. So they can't make more of themselves. If they can't make more of themselves, then they can't make you sick. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the second episode, and August was his first. So is it something that just stays there and One of the, from growing, but there's always some little guy back in this? He might have been reinfected, and that's the problem. So they, and the nice thing is they, t they happen to be talking about Lyme disease in the yeah, book. So it's caused by a, a specific, it's a little spirochete bacteria carried by that lovely little deer tick. And because we live where we live, we have tons and tons of deer ticks that can pass this on. We can treat it with antibiotic. Again, this is the, this is the organism here. It's, called, it's a spirochete, spiral organism. It's passed on when the tick bites because it usually hangs out around its mouth region. Not all deer ticks are infected with this spirochete, but there's a good percentage that are, and that bacterium can cause Lyme disease. So basically, some of the toxins this nasty little critter gives off as it reproduces itself are things that attack joint. Yes, That's someone's leg. His and first indication is when his leg comes up and he's right, and he goes limp. But here's here's the, the misconception. You know, you see pictures like this. Not everybody exhibits that. Sometimes if you get bit in the head, you're not going to see that. Even if it's, you know, and it might only be that big. It's not going to spread across your whole body. So there's other, there's other antibiotics that have been developed that aren't penicillin delivers. There, there's different ones. But those medicines are sometimes super hard to get. Yep. And sometimes they're super nasty, too. Um, yeah. One of the problems um, with antibiotic use is, remember, not all bacteria are harmful. So we're going to target the bacteria. We're going to kill off those nasty guys, but we're also going to kill off a good number of the good guys, too. So sometimes people will react to antibiotics by getting, you know, really bad diarrhea. 
that's a problem because they're killing off some of that nice normal bacteria that's helping us digest things in our gut. So after we finish that course of bacteria, the best thing to do is maybe go get some probiotics to kind of replenish all the good bacteria in your gut. So it's, it's, it's a difficult balance. Um, some women will understand this. If you kill off some of those nice normal bacteria, some other little nasties might come and invade, like our friends the yeasts. Yeah. So how many people have gone on antibiotics and then have to go to back to the doctors to get yeast treatments? You guys are lucky you're good with that whole situation. Yeah, and that's why, because you, you, you kill off some of that normal goodness and those nasty little critters can come in and take advantage. Well, and the problem in this country, we overuse antibiotics. Most of our illness is not caused by bacteria. What's it caused by? Virus. And what can you take to cure a virus? What do you have to do? Tough it out, <laughs> suck it up. We have some medications uh, like some of those uh, Tamiflu type medications, nasal sprays, that can actually help cells protect themselves against viral infection. So they can shorten the length Wait, of a flu. A it depends, and it depends on, yes, Zycam. But again, it depends on when you start taking them and everybody's going to react to them in a little bit of a different way. So they can be effective, they cannot be effective. A hot toddy will take care of cold in one night. Margaritas. All right. 2001, endospores of a bacterium that caused anthrax. Yeah, I remember that. You remember that? We're male to members, yeah. This is, so biological warfare. This is one of the nasty little endospores that can cause all sorts of respiratory issues. Five people died from this attack. Other bacterium considered to have dangerous potential as a weapon, Clostridium botulinum. Where can we find them? Yeah, that's botulism. Why is that a problem? Anybody ever can? It's all over in your environment in small, small quantities. It's a anaerobic bacteria. Yeah. No, nope. one of the toxins it gives off is actually, yeah, this is probably way too complex. It stops your muscles from being able to relax. Because when you take anatomy class, we're going to talk about this big chemical reaction that causes your muscles to shorten and lengthen. And part of that reaction involves ATP, adenosine triphosphate, coming in contact with one of the molecules that allows your muscles to relax after they've contracted. The toxin from Clostridium binds to that site. So your muscles can't do what? Can't relax. It's called lockjaw. Have you ever heard of lockjaw? What? Because once the muscles contract, they can't relax. The jar isn't the issue. It's your diaphragm, which is a big muscle. That once it contracts, and it, what does the diaphragm do for you? It lets you breathe by contracting and relaxing and changing the space in your thoracic cavity. You can't do that. You can't breathe. You can't breathe. You yes. So that's the toxin from this nasty little guy. And again, uh, producer of the endotoxin botulinum, which blocks transmission of nerve signals that cause muscle contraction and is the deadliest poison on Earth. Just when it's concentrated in its concentrated form. It's all over the place. So when you can, what do you have to do? You have to be very, very careful. You have to heat your product up to a fairly high heat. Boiling. Yeah, and then you have to make sure that it's pressurized, sealed when you're done. To get rid of what? Any endospores that might be in your environment. Now most bacteria, correct, to kill what? 
those endospores. Remember, they're, they're pretty hardy compared to all the other little bacteria that hang out with them. Right. And make sure it gets done what? Without exposing whatever's in there to the air. To the air. When I can, um, you can, yeah, you can do it. We do it all the time. When we do spaghetti um, sauce. Right. With it still boiling. Have you ever had a problem with contamination? No. But wait, now what are you going to see in your canning if it's contaminated? No, you're not going to see it. What are you going to see? The, you ever see the ball jars, how they, they form that suction seal? That little bubble. Yeah. If these guys are there, they're going to start producing. Exactly. It's going to pop up. My oh, did you? Oh, my God. Yeah. All of a sudden, I kept hearing this. Oh, such a waste of wine. I go into my wine room, and I've got bottles of wine exploding everywhere. And it's because something got in there. Got in there that entire batch of wine was destroyed. Oh, so sad. But they, they, they can survive, these, these nasty little guys can survive without oxygen. So in that canning jar, if we don't kill them before we put that cover on, they're going to start reproducing and producing gases as, as a waste product. And that's what happens with, when your jars pop. Uh, yeah, if they go long enough, they'll explode. But sometimes people don't realize, because you can't smell them and you can't see them, when a can is chubby, or if you can at all, and that little button's popped, it's gone. See ya. Because these guys are reproducing. And very toxic. Those substances are extremely toxic. Yep. If you've got a dent or something in the can, don't buy it. No. really? Yeah. Don't buy dented cans. Yeah, or, or cans that's got little bubbles. Yep. Any, anything that's swelled at all, don't, don't buy it. Yep. Well, that's different. If you drop a can, like I do that all the time because I'm a klutz, you drop a can, you dent it, and then you use it right away, that's different. But you don't want to go and buy something that's been on the shelf for God only knows how long that's been dented because you, you compromise the product. You know, there's, there could be a tiny little crack in there that would allow... Yeah. Or could be. I mean, p potentially there couldn't be. But you do, do you want to take that chance? Yeah, no. So <laughs> another uh, nasty little bacterium that causes plague is also a potential biological weapon. Uh, some of the different plagues, if you, if you Google plague and read about some of the different incidents of, huh? Yeah, the bubonic plague. And you know why they called it bubonic plague? Because of these nasty, they call these little pus-filled sacks bubos. And that's what the bubonic plague caused, one, one of the side effects, lovely side effects. So those little bubos under the skin, that's why they called it bubonic plague. Uh, transmitted by the fleas of rodents. So again, sanit sanit sanitary conditions can help prevent some of these nasty little pathogens. Um, antibiotics can treat this, but a lot of the people, unfortunately, that were exposed to these conditions, by the time they realized an antibiotic could help them, even if that existed at that time, in many of these plagues you read about, there was no such thing as an antibiotic, um, would wipe out lots and lots of people. So But not everybody got bitten. It just seems like yeah, exactly. It seems like it's hard to But that's like, you know, uh, has anybody's dog ever had fleas? It's so hard. Has everybody's dog had fleas? Yeah. Not mine. Mine does. 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 Mine does
So you guys, if you if you were the flea-ridden guys, it's too bad, so sad for you, but we'd be all set because our dog never had. Yeah, so you know what I mean? How many rodents were around that, that, that Correct. That but think about, that, uh, time. yes, but who's the people that were more exposed to those rodents? The homeless and the poor and the deaf. That had to live in conditions that were close to those rodents. Okay. Some of the some of the higher ups didn't may not have been exposed. Correct. A lot a lot of our knowledge of how sanitary conditions can actually prevent us from getting disease. So yeah, they were lucky. I mean there's so many viruses. Think about the flu. You know, when you think about it. How come a whole bunch of people can get it and some don't? You just have to have those well, in the right conditions. If you're exposed to the organism under the right conditions. Right. Pathogenic bacteria are in the minority among the prokaryotes, though. So they're all, not all nasty. Many of them are quite common. Many of them are even beneficial. So not all of them are bad for us. So far more common are species that are actually essential to our well-being, either directly or indirectly. Um, if it wasn't for the prokaryotes, a lot of our waste treatment centers wouldn't exist. Imagine if all our waste could never be broken down. Yeah, that's a scary little visual. So prokaryotes play a very essential role in recycling chemicals into our environment, getting those organic materials back into the environment so they can be used by other organisms. Breakdown of organic wastes and dead organisms. Again, imagine if everything that died could not be broken down. Bioremediation is the use of organisms to remove pollutants. So we know of some organisms that can actually do things like eat oil to remove what? Yeah, if when we have an oil slick. Well, of course. So can we remove pollutants from water, air, soil? Familiar, ex familiar example is the use of prokaryotic decomposers in sewage treatment plants. Whatever happened to uh, that whole oil spill oh, <laughs> No, it's never going to get cleaned up. You don't hear about it anymore. It's not in the news anymore. A lot of that stuff, what happened to it? Yeah, and that's going to affect that ecosystem for ever. Is right. Oh, but um, no, the B, begin with a B. BP. No, it's, gonna, it's going to have long-lasting effects on that ecosystem for thousands and thousands of years. Because you think of all the organisms that play upon each other. You don't hear about it anymore. No, I know. I'm just saying. But yes. Yeah. It's no. It's well, not, not. Nowhere gone. Exactly. It's too much money. People with money can So prokaryotes are very important. And who has a well? Anybody have a well? Septic system. Get a septic system. What's one of the important things for you to do to help maintain the health of your septic system? Put stuff. What is that stuff? Yeah, it's exactly. I know. You supposed to do it. Oh, somebody else does it. Okay. A plumber said you can use yeast. Packages of yeast. Yep. In fact, you're because you think he's afraid of the red X might kill the good bacteria. Really? Yeah. No, Ridex is no, a, I know, but that's what, a that's what he said. Isn't that interesting? It's way too expensive. Yeah. All I did was I took two packets of yeast, I dumped it in my septic tank, I covered it up, I haven't touched it since. And, then my septic and do you pump out your septic tank? No. You don't? No, the yeast needs it. Oh, you think so? Well, I. 13 years ago. 13 years ago.
diaper and wipes. Got stuck in that pipe that went out too far, and we were walking right there. So, and he opened that up and hit that paper towel. It was going again. My advice to you all about your septic system every three years. Use some product that is prokaryotic to keep the integrity of your septic system well. Because if you've ever had your septic system back up into your house. Oh, I've heard that's pretty gross. Yeah. And when you complain about the price it costs for the plumber to come and do his thing, those plumbers earn every penny they make. So you need to make sure that all of that outflow stays flowing. Do it. No, and it, it's, it's so important because you don't want to rip up your septic system and redo it. Yeah. So these little guys do an amazing job, but you have to remember, you have to keep them happy. I have a dirty old system, so I You want to keep them happy, happy, happy. So, and one of, one of the things to help keep these guys happy is to not use very toxic chemicals that will kill them as well. So one of the things, and even though I love it because I'm a little bit OCD when it comes to cleaning, bleach. Be very careful, don't use toxic, toxic stuff that's going to kill them. Yeah, so, and that's one of the reasons why they say try to stay away from certain substances because basically what they're doing is decreasing the number of these guys in your septic system. And you want these guys to be happy, happy, happy. So use the Ridex, use whatever, the yeast. I've never heard that, but it, that's interesting. And um, make sure you keep them happy. Huh? Rid oh, yeast. A Ridex is a product. It's basically a bunch of bunch of bacteria in in lyophilized form. So once you add them to water, it's gonna wake them up again. Yeah, but Ridex is cheap. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't have a septic tank. Yeah. Not good. Yeah. As I was cleaning mine up, because they put my septic tank in upside down, um, I, I, yeah, that was not good. Yeah, yeah. We found it out the hard way. It was like a year, so a year and a half later. Because what happens is the, the waste comes in, the bacteria eat, it funnels out the other side. So this side is higher, or I can't remember. Yeah. Well, when you turn them upside down, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work that way. So. Did you make them pay for it? They, yeah, thank goodness, the house. Yeah, but still, I, uh, uh, I was, I'm cleaning it up in my bathroom. I'm going, don't think about what it is. Don't think about what it is. Just clean it up. Oh. Okay, some bacteria can decompose petroleum, and that's, um, again, I'm not sure if they're um, something that existed in nature or something that was developed. I, I don't know the answer to that question. That can be something you Google up, but um, these guys are really helpful in um, cleaning up some oil spills, getting rid of, yep, protists. They're eukaryotes that are not fungi, not animals, and not plants. Mostly unicellular, and they are ancestors to all other eukaryotes. So this is a kind of in-between, and we will pick up, I think this is a good place to stop, with these guys on Monday. So guys. 
Monday we'll finish this. Wednesday's the test. Correct. I didn't say that. But remember, it's basically three PowerPoints. So you have the Chapter 13, 14 PowerPoint, you have the Ecology PowerPoint, and then you have this PowerPoint. And that's what your exam is going to be on, and that's it. You can read the chapters. There's a lot more in there. Um, yeah, and you might, if you want to, use them to kind of supplement if you don't understand something. But everything, when I sit down, basically when I sit down to make the exam, I'm going to sit down with the PowerPoints and create my questions. So. <laughs> yeah. Good. Okay? Uh, yeah, yes.